Society Library. I'm Francesca Stanfield, a library trustee, but most importantly, tonight, a friend of Paul Friedman, who will speak on his brilliant book, 10 Restaurants That Changed America. Paul grew up in New York City, and his parents were devoted members of this library, so there's a special delight in having him speak here tonight. Before we begin, a few requests. May I ask uh, you please to silence cell phones or anything that might disrupt the presentation. I also want to mention that tonight's book is for sale in a Peluso family exhibition gallery by our friends from the Corner Bookstore, and Professor Friedman will be happy to sign copies following this talk. On behalf of the library, I want to thank those of you who have already supported this year's annual fund. Contributions from members and friends are vital. They help the library meet day-to-day -day expenses not covered by membership fees, including maintaining and expanding the collection, keeping our doors open seven days a week, offering electronic resources, children's programs, seminars, and this evening's lecture. There is still time to donate to the annual fund by mail or online. Each contribution, large or small, makes a big difference. Thank you for your support. I first met Paul Friedman 11 years ago when I was beginning to research a novel set in the 12th century. A friend, a fellow Yale alumnus, had told me about Professor Friedman, then the chair of the history department, and also mentioned that he had been paid talk for 18 years at Vanderbilt University before joining the Yale faculty in 1997. I admit I was rather daunted and continue to be when I read Paul Friedman's CV. The sheer number of his scholarly papers, the impressive books he's written, out of, including Out of the East, Spices, and the Medieval Imagination, which the scholar Peter Brown has called a magical book, and the many awards he has received including the Haskins Medal by the Medieval Academy of America in 2002 for his book, Images of the Medieval Peasant. Despite my initial trepidation, I got up my courage and sent Professor E. Friedman an email. He responded very generously and subsequently asked if I would like to order the seminar he was teaching that fall on medieval political history. I did and was enthralled. This fall, I've been fortunate to attend another of his seminars which has explored the significance of the 12th century. I tell you this only to give you some idea of the breadth of Paul's knowledge, scholarship, and of his interests, all of which are seasoned by a certain joie de vivre and intense curiosity about contemporary culture. He may be a scholar of the Middle Ages, but he is in all other ways a Renaissance man. <laughs> He can analyze the writings of Peter Abelard and the intricacies of the medieval pepper trade with the same vivid intelligence he does the significance of Delmonico's or the rise and fall of the influence of French cuisine. When Paul first told me about the idea for this book, I knew it would be wonderful, a perfect extension of his many studies of the history of food. This is not just the story of 10 famous American restaurants and all the ingredients, not to make a pun, which have contributed to the emergence of an American cuisine, but also a tapestry of our culture, our history, of the ebb and flow of immigrant groups and their contributions. In short, a portrait of our questing society. It is, in all ways, a delicious journey. Now I give you Paul Friedman. Well, now after that introduction, I don't know if I can I'm close to living up to it. <laughs> uh, let me give this a try. So I, I am, as uh, my day job is as a medieval historian, and I am interested as well in the history of American restaurants. And I will say that. Um, the 
uh, uh, craziest archive I've ever worked in, and I've worked in about 15 Spanish archives and maybe a half dozen other European archives, is the one at Antoine's in New Orleans. <laughs> so although the, um, you know, the manuscripts at Vic, where I did my dissertation, go back to the 10th century, they don't actually have mouse droppings. <laughs> In fairness to Antoine's, A, they preserved a lot of stuff, and B, they had damage from Hurricane Katrina. So this is Antoine's archives. The restaurants I discussed in addition to Antoine's in this book are Delmonico's in New York, um, Schraff's, uh, which as many of you know is a small chain in the northeast of casual but genteel spots, Howard Johnson's, Mama Leone's, an Italian restaurant, the Mandarin in San Francisco, a Chinese restaurant. Sylvia's in New York, a soul food restaurant, or uh, African American exemplar. The elegant mid-century French restaurant Le Pavillon. The Four Seasons, just closed. And Chez Panisse in Berkeley. Some of these may be surprising. Uh, the point about this book is influential restaurants, not the greatest restaurants. So they are either restaurants that really had a direct influence or that exemplify some kind of cuisine that you can't write about American cuisine uh, without considering. And the, the, the book is an attempt to look at American cuisine. There are various ways of doing that besides restaurants. So for example, uh, people particularly in the middle of the country have asked me, uh, well, you know, why is everything from New York or San Francisco? And that's true for restaurants, because those are the influential places. If you're going to write about American cuisine generally, more influential would be the rural South or New England. So the point of this is uh, to solve what's kind of a mystery. Is there such a thing as American cuisine? If you ask people around the world, they think it's McDonald's. On the other hand, it's not immediately identifiable in the way that Italian or Chinese food, whether our impressions are accurate or not, we have an idea of what those cuisines ought to look like. And this question of what is American cuisine actually goes back quite far to the um, uh, visit of the Russian Grand Duke uh, Alexis, who um, came in 1871 and 1872, and uh, here is the menu from his visit at Delmonico's. I don't think you can read this, but it doesn't really matter. It's all in French. Uh, it is uh, not for its time over the top, but certainly for us. It's what, 10 or 11 courses. Um, it has uh, the two requisite fancy dishes that had the most prestige in 1871, 1872, and indeed in Edith Wharton novels in the entire 19th century. And those are terrapin, turtle, terrapin a la Maryland in this case, and canvas back duck. And these are the ones that are sort of, canvas back duck, they don't try to render in French. Everything <laughs> else is in French. But um, uh, he said at one occasion that there was no such thing as American cuisine, that the fine cuisine of America was French. And I don't think he meant to be insulting because the same could have been said of Russia. Uh, the Russian court, of which he was a part, spoke French, uh, ate French food. That was the international prestigious food of the time. But there was a series of indignant protests. How dare you say this? American regional food is so great. And as back ducks, for example, are not French. Um, uh, ice cream. Uh, various kinds of uh, oyster dishes. Now, they have oysters in Europe, but they usually don't have cooked oyster dishes. So this kind of controversy um, uh, comes up again and again. There's a Nero Wolf uh, mystery that some of you may know called Too Many Cooks, where the detective defends American food against the insults of French chefs. And he goes on and on about various kinds of regional uh, cooking. Creole tripe of New Orleans, for example. Tennessee opossum. Uh, Philadelphia snapper soup. Uh, but, you know, despite this defense of American regional food, American food, as in terms of its regional, rural, or um, game-oriented identity, has
has declined uh, in the 140 or so years since Alexis's visit. So this doesn't mean that there weren't elegant restaurants or that you couldn't find wonderful food in the United States, but for there to be a cuisine, the uh, American anthropologist Sidney Mintz has said that a cuisine is an agreed upon set of tastes. It's something where ordinary people have very strong opinions, not just the cuisine of an elite. So you see this in New Haven, for example, where pizza will just, the pizza is uh, a, an object of fanatical devotion and discussion among ordinary people. On the other hand, they don't make it themselves. Uh, there are southern towns in which you know everybody makes pecan pie, and there are debates as to whose is best. But this is not really what made America great, or at least what made America, America in culinary terms. America is about variety uh, and not about everybody making the same dish and everybody having a standard of judgment as to who does it best. So as I said, I wanted to look at the most influential dishes, the influential restaurants, and not necessarily the best. So um, yeah, I guess I did want that. Just um, to exemplify this problem of American cuisine and American regionalism, this is a menu from Louisville, Kentucky, around maybe 1965. So the restaurant is in Louisville. It's called the New Orleans House, and they're offering a New England clam. <laughs> so obviously we have a variety, a, a, a originality, but this, this is a country that doesn't really know what it's presenting. I think. Uh, Howard Johnson's, okay? Influential, not necessarily the highest quality. You can't write a history of American food without chain restaurants. You can't have fast food as it is developed in the modern world without franchising, without roadside orientation, both of which Howard Johnson's, if they didn't invent the perfected. This is a wartime Howard Johnson's menu from Rochester, New York, uh, 1944, as you can see. Um, they're preoccupied with uh, important historical events, but on the inside, they've got the fried clams and the, the <laughs> Frankforts, remember? They call them Frankforts, not Frankfurters, and they serve them in a peculiar triangular buttered bun. Uh, the ice cream came with a little cookie on the top. So they actually were very creative and original, even though they're remembered as being uh, rather bland. So what I, I, if this is not, American cuisine as a whole, at least I believe that you can't imagine American cuisine or describe American cuisine without uh, the innovations made by these 10 restaurants. The restaurant itself, as a place to dine out, pioneered in 18th century Paris, was brought to the US by Delmonico's, the first of the restaurants in New York, which opened in the 1830s. And then there are various other kinds of restaurant fashions that I hope these exemplify, at least many of these fashions. The tourist destination, typified by Antoine's and Mama Leone's. The inexpensive middle class restaurant. Uh, uh, chain restaurant that Schratz and Howard Johnson's uh, represent. Restaurants presenting the cuisine of another country, which we take for granted, but which until recently was really uh, unique to the U.S. and to some extent the U.K. Other countries, you know, in Italy they had Italian restaurants. They didn't call them Italian restaurants, they were just <laughs> restaurants. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, then the Mandarin and the uh, Mama Leone's represent that. Distinct American ways of eating include roadside restaurants, Howard Johnson's again, and the late 20th century shift towards offering seasonal menus and menus that are more American than French, pioneered by Four Seasons and Chaitonese, the last of these. So Delmonico's is the first. This is the oldest surviving menu in the New York, um, the Museum of the City of New York. Uh, it was the first real restaurant in the US, real restaurant meaning not a tavern, not a takeout place, not a place where you could get a meal at a certain time or have lunch, but a place that was itself a destination, where they had a long menu. This menu is about 20 pages. Uh, it has you know, 14 game dishes alone, where you could 
have a variety of hours instead of coming into what was called a table d'hote. Table d'hote is where they serve like at one o'clock. You come and they serve usually family style and that's the meal. Here you could come in and dine with the people you wanted to dine with. Uh, you could come at 12 or 12.30 or one. You couldn't come necessarily 24 seven, but there were a variety of times it was open. So the restaurant, as opposed to the inn or tavern, is marked by choice, choice of companions, choice of dishes, choice of times. And by those criteria, uh, Delmonico's was the first. It was gracious, lavish, it was a French restaurant, at least in name, but it had American dishes like the terrapin and the canvas back ducks. It invented some dishes like lobster Newburgh, maybe eggs benedict, um, certainly baked Alaska. Of the restaurants presented in my book, half of them have some relation to French cuisine. Delmonico's, which said it was French, Antoine's, which although we would describe it as Creole, claimed to be a French restaurant, never used the word Creole until really the, maybe the 1980s. Um, Le Pavillon really was as about as French as you could get in the United States. Um, and that is the most uh, self-consciously French restaurant. Chez Pies began as a French restaurant and then turned into the exemplar of what is called New American cuisine or California cuisine or local war cuisine. And then finally Four Seasons, founded in 1959 deliberately as a not French but elegant restaurant. And not French but elegant was very radical in 1959. The first issue of the New York Times uh, Guide to Dining Out that Craig Claiborne edited in 1962, um, there are, I think, seven three-star restaurants. Uh, six of them are French. You know, they all have a Le or La. <laughs> Le Pavillon, uh, La Caravelle, um, La Grenouille, um, uh, the Coach House, sort of was American, and that's the one exception. So um, one of the big stories about the last 50 years is the eclipse of French hegemony. It doesn't mean that French food is not as good as it ever was. It's just that it doesn't control or define haute cuisine worldwide in the way that it did. So America is not unique in that. Um, some of this is due to globalization of taste, particularly the rise of Asia. Some of it is due to uh, the uh, general fragmentation of taste that we've seen uh, where no one center defines fashion, just as Hollywood is very important in movies, but it's not the only place that defines movies. Paris remains very important in fashion, but so is Milan, so is Tokyo. So it's not surprising in some sense that uh, the French ability to dictate what haute cuisine is, which goes back to the 18th century, uh, should have ended I would say probably around 1980. What is unusual is that the United States itself should have reinvented certain kinds of local and quality orientations that uh, define the way people dine in New York uh, today. The two movements that define cuisine today, it seems to me, are um, this emphasis on the local, on the quality, on the seasonal, and then still variety. America still has a tremendous number of so-called ethnic restaurants, uh, international restaurants, uh, and I'll talk about them in a moment. But uh, the thing that America pioneered, although this is sort of, uh, if not vanishing, at least taken for granted, is the middle class dining. So as of 1900, you'd have places like Delmonico's on the high end, and then kind of working men's taverns or hash houses or free lunch bars on the low end. Um, okay, so here is Antoine's in about 1900. Um, uh, Schraff's is the great pioneer of not only middle class dining, as many of you will remember, genteel, gracious, polite, uh, not very expensive, uh, but also of dining designed for women. And that doesn't mean that Delmonico's didn't welcome women. I mean, right from day one, Delmonico's was delighted to have female customers, as long as they were accompanied by men. <laughs> uh, 
so restaurants tended not to know how to distinguish what they would consider, or more importantly, their male patrons would consider respectable from non-respectable women. And the greatest fear was that respectable women would be taken for non-respectable women. Uh, crafts welcomed women in groups or alone, women who were shopping, women who were uh, working in offices or in retail establishments, and not only created an atmosphere that they were supposed to like, but offered food that they were supposed to like. And the food that women in America are supposed to like from 1900 on is light food accompanied by very rich desserts. <laughs> so I don't, uh, I'm not saying this is true. I will say that my grandmother, who took me to Schrafft's, liked cottage cheese and fruit as an entree, which was considered light uh, at the time, and then followed by a banana split. <laughs> Um, but ethnic food is the thing that remains ethnic variety, and this goes back to the late 19th century. Here's a 1938 New Yorker cover, and uh, you don't have to read the little dishes mentioned on the side. The idea is these are all different ethnic restaurants, uh, and they present some stereotypes of uh, um, the time. So the Italian restaurant is on the bottom, uh, a Jewish restaurant. Uh, Russian, uh, uh, Scandinavian smorgasbord, which is the least picturesque and the people are the best dressed. Uh, Japanese restaurant, Middle Eastern. Uh, the point being that although the mix is different in 1938, the same idea that New York is characterized by variety, as well as by this high-end elegance, as well as by the rather bland, middle-class, chicken a king kind of offerings of places like Shrouds. Um, uh, this is Cecilia Chang, the owner of the Mandarin, the Chinese restaurant in my list, and this is a picture of her in Tokyo in 1950, um, having fled uh, Beijing to the south of China when the Japanese invaded, and then having fled to Japan from Shanghai in 1949 with the communist takeover. She then came to San Francisco, opened this restaurant in 1961, uh, she is still very much alive and kicking at the age of 97. Uh, this is her from our, her Christmas card, I think the year before last. So I would say of all the restaurants I worked on, this was the most fun, because she's such a character. Uh, this is a woman who, when I interviewed her, she said at the end of the interview in San Francisco, well, when are you coming back? And I said, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure, uh, it's far away, but it's true that my wife's 60th birthday is coming up and she wants to, she wants to celebrate it at the French Laundry uh, restaurant in the Napa Valley. And, you know, and then I said, judiciously, I'm not sure when I'll get a reservation there. And she said, oh, I'll get a reservation for you. No problem. <laughs> When's your wife's birthday? And I said, well, you know, it's June 8th. So. Oh, no problem. And I'll come with you. <laughs> so, you can imagine. I told my wife, well, I have, the good news is that we've got a reservation in French Laundry on your birthday. Uh, and we'll have company. <laughs> Scintillating and interesting company. Um, so uh, uh, one of the interesting things about this, not deliberately, is that of the 10 restaurants, four were created by women. I didn't sort of set out to give women equal time. Women are not, in general, involved in founding or managing restaurants as much as men are, but more than you would think. So Cecilia Chang is one, Mama Leone's, Louisa Leone herself, whose restaurant, although we remember it, if we remember it as this gigantic, schlocky, touristy theater district place, began across the street from the Metropolitan Opera on 39th Street, and it began as a bohemian, little, you know, mama in the kitchen, check tablecloths, Chianti bottle with the wax dripping candle. Uh, but she was told to go into the restaurant business by Enrico Caruso himself, who uh, dined with her because he knew her husband, a wine importer. And um, this was founded in 1906, I think. Sylvia's in Harlem, founded by Sylvia Woods in uh, 1962, and still 
going strong. She died about three or four years ago. So the restaurants have a variety of uh, ethnic types, a variety of classes and neighborhoods. Uh, this is Henri Soule, the proprietor of Le Pavillon Sampling Caviar. This is the Four Seasons interior. Um, you know that it's landmark, so it won't be completely different under the new management, but of course uh, it, it won't be the same either. Uh, and then Alice Waters, the founder of Chez Panisse. Of all the restaurants that I have in, well, of all 10, uh, nobody has said, what is Chez Panisse doing in there? Uh, people will say, you know, well, why is it McDonald's there? Or uh, why did you choose Mamalioni's when it was so crappy? Uh, <laughs> this is the only one that nobody has pushed uh, back against. Uh, you can't have the cuisine that we have today uh, without Alice Waters. So um, uh, I think I will stop here and ask for your questions. I could go on and on about the book, but the whole point is to give you an idea of what's in it rather than a blow-by-blow -blow, uh, uh, description. So I, uh, I appreciate your being here, and I, I invite your questions and comments. I think some of them are ca very casual restaurants like Shake Shack uh, uh -huh. or Sweet Greens. Uh, in the one case, there's a tendency to um, have ordinary foods but try to make them better. Um, museum food. Hmm. The museum, all the new museum food is, is much fancier. Uh, so uh, Untitled at the Whitney, this uh, restaurant called In Situ at the San Francisco Modern Museum of Art, which is now one of the hottest tickets in San Francisco. Perhaps that will even spread to airports and other captive audiences. But the idea of trying to make food better in institutional or um, low to no choice settings, that would be another trend. Different takes on Asian influence. So there's a restaurant in San Francisco called Benu. Um, that has a kind of Korean, Japanese, uh, slightly molecular, mm -hmm. gastronomic <coughs> profile. So those are some, yeah. So what did you find to be the predominant factor that brought these restaurants to their influential status? Was it uh, a genius chef? Was it a marketing guru? Was it just word of mouth by the audience who talked about it? Is there some thread that there are several different threads. So there are some examples of restaurants that were uh, famous and successful in terms of reputation, but um, took a long time to make any money. Four Seasons and Chez Panisse, notably. Uh, decades in both cases, you know, where they barely survived financially, but were famous. In some cases, it is fanatical attention to quality and detail, and that includes Howard Johnson's. Uh, in some cases, it is hard to see what was unique. So Antoine's is an example of a, a lot of different things. Um, there's a genius there for creativity and a kind of representation of New Orleans society. Uh, so I would say it's different in each case. The thing that is most common is fanatical attention to detail. Uh, a kind of management, uh, rather than say good advertising or um, uh, you know viral, as we would now say, reputation building. Thank you. How many of the restaurants were open when you were starting out? Were There's a debate as to whether Delmonico's, or one could debate, is Delmonico's the one that exists now the same? It's in the same place, or in one of the same places. The original Delmonico's had several locations. 
uh, uh, sometimes simultaneously. Uh, it closed in prohibition. Sorry? Thrasks and now Johnson? Uh, Thrasks that no longer exists, period. Yeah, exactly. And it hasn't since the 80s. Yeah. Howard Johnson's, there's one, right? It's in Lake George, New York. I'm told it's no good. Of course, <laughs> how, how can it be? Where are they going to get, you know, there's no Howard Johnson's ice cream. There is no parent company. So they've got fried clams, but they're fried clams, I'm told. I haven't been there, but I'm told, you know, they're, they're just, they just they like went out and bought canned fried clams and put bread on them. They're not, they're not the, uh, so, um, you know, the, uh, they're to all intents and purposes, they're all intents and purposes extinct. Too. Yes, sir. I'm just curious as somebody who's sort of seeped in the medieval world when you're doing this work, if it's just a sort of a separate interest or if you found certain parallels like thought centers or were there anything that, that hold it together for you? Yes. So uh, I, I won't, don't say this in any kind of semi-academic setting because it insults my American history colleagues, but people say, oh, this involves so much research, so much work. And, and it's actually quite easy compared to things where your sources are uh, 800 years old, written on parchment, in archives that are only open two or three hours a day, that are certainly not digitized, uh, and handwritten, and you know, in, in varied kind of handwritings. So all of this is in print, it's in English, it's on paper, a lot of it is available on the web. Well, what's the problem? Um, uh, but uh, I continue to be a medievalist. That is my main job. And to some extent, my hobby has gotten out of control. Uh, and I'm not sure I can put the genie back in the bottle. I guess I'm going to find out uh, very soon. Well, have you ever written about medieval cuisine? Or what I have. I have. Uh, uh, I gave a paper a couple of weeks ago at Dartmouth on fish in the Middle Ages and um, what fish were prestigious and what fish were ordinary. But a medieval food is hard to work on. Um, you really need a certain expertise. Uh, there are about 150, maybe 160 cookbooks that survive from the Middle Ages, which is either 159 more than you might expect, <laughs> or very few compared to, say, alchemical manuscripts or medical manuscripts, to say nothing of sermons. Um, but they're very hard to deal with. You really have to have a training that I, I don't have, or a specialization, because it's hard to tell which ones are related to other ones. Anything that's handwritten right, has much greater variety than something that's standardized so and printed. There are medieval cooking specialists? In, in there are, there are. The, the leading ones, I think, if I had to name one, uh, a man named Bruno Lorio in Paris, Massimo Montanari in Italy, uh, Terence Scully in Canada. Uh, and so I can make some little contributions, and I've done, I did a lot of work on spices in particular, but uh, um, these, these are the people who've really devoted their, their, their lives to it. Yeah, 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 the two or three runners up. Um, there's a restaurant in Chicago called Alinea that is the most successful exemplar of molecular gastronomy, you know, the transformative foams and uh, liquid nitrogen where you turn things into something else. El Bouilly was the famous example in Europe. Noma is sort of a representative of that now. Um, French Laundry which combines the local seasonal emphasis of Chez Panisse with some of the exuberance of uh, molecular gastronomy movement. Uh, Union Square Cafe, so Danny Meyer wrote the introduction to this book. Um, he and I have appeared in various places where you know, the interviewer or the, the, or the host will say, why did you write the introduction to this book if you didn't even include one of your restaurants? <laughs> So you know, the standard answer to that is the one I gave before. If I were writing 10 restaurants that are changing America now, uh, I'd have uh, certainly Shake Shack and maybe Union Square Cafe, which is opening, reopening tomorrow, I'm told. Um, to what do you attribute the mania of Italian cooking that you want to go to these restaurants because museums want a main restaurant to attract people to the museums. Yeah. And they have all discovered that if you have a, quote, name restaurant, your attendance increases dramatically. And that's not just true in museums, true of lots of 
of other places. Yeah, I don't have a good explanation for that. I mean, I have an explanation for why food is regarded as a topic worthy of investigation as opposed to merely consumption. Uh, because it touches our lives in many ways. Uh, it is a marker of class and of taste. It is a form of socializing. And as a form of socializing, it involves business, romance, friendship, family. It covers all of the emotional bases. The particular fad for dining out, uh, some of it, you know, in 2015, Americans spent more money dining out than on groceries. Uh, and that's not necessarily a good thing either. Uh, but that doesn't have to do with the cutting edge, high end dining. So the cutting edge, high end dining is the sort of um, uh, upper class equivalent of a general phenomenon. It's not something that is unique to New York or Brooklyn or millennials, even though those may be the highest concentration of people with those tastes. Sir. Fine dining, the pendulum repeatedly swings away from French cuisine and French trappings. But would you agree that aside from the Japanese model, the actual model of fine dining restaurants, the structure, the structure of service, the way the kitchen is set up, it still hasn't got very far from a model which you can trace directly back to France? Certainly the way kitchens are run and the terminology, like ballet, is not necessarily dominated by France, but the terminology of ballet uh, and choreography is French. The um, Italian influence, though, along with the Japanese, is extremely important. And it's Italian food that, to some extent, has replaced French food, not the entire spectrum. And part of that is because it's simpler to make. It's more profitable. You can charge a lot of money for a pasta dish with some vegetables, uh, at, whereas there is no inexpensive French dish or style that is equivalent to that. It also, people like grilled food. People think that grilled food is lighter than food that's served with sauces. Some of it is just appearance. So Italian food has the uh, transformative ability, can be rustic if that's what you want, hearty if that's what you want. No one would say that Babo is a light restaurant. Uh, on the other hand, Setimetsa in this neighborhood is. So the, the polymorphousness of Italian cuisine, similar to Japanese. There's a low end, there's a hearty end, there's an unbelievably sophisticated end, and other cuisines can't move along that spectrum quite as well. Yes. You know, we went to uh, uh, Italy in 1950s in America? Yes, but not in the way that is stereotypically described. That is, spices were not used to cover up the taste of meat that had gone off. They were not used to preserve meat. They had much better ways of preserving meat. Salting, better in the sense of effective and better in the sense of cheap. Salt, smoking, drying, um, salt, smoking, drying, curing, uh, and um, uh, yeah, anyway, smoking. Uh, uh, spices were more prestigious in the Middle Ages as healthful, as magical. They were credited with properties um, that are related to our ideas of wellness. So spices are more like, um, you know, things that are described as uh, good for you, like quinoa, or, um, you know, um, antioxidants, uh, or kale, or something like that. They have this overtone of being both delicious and um, exotic and healthful, and that's a very hard combination to, to beat. Uh, we've lost a lot of that. On the other hand, we like spicy food. Americans like much more bland food when many of us were growing up. Uh, 
and but things like buffalo chicken wings, crappy though they may be, yeah. are, are spicy and people love them. Well, for example, I think certain like turmeric, a lot of people take now. They think it increases their mental. That's a medieval idea, yeah, right? So it's coming right. back. Right, but yeah. that's recent. Yes. Correct. Correct, and that's there's a return to the Middle Ages in certain <laughs> certain, <laughs> certain aspects of life. Uh, yes. uh, the, 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 the two things that have really created enrollment rises in medieval history classes are unfortunately 9/11 and uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, Chicago, the Midwest, and I, it was curious that you that 1938 New Yorker cover showed a Scandinavian smorgasbord, which I remember from my youth here in New York. You don't find those anymore. Are they too bland? There are many cuisines that were very big. Uh, uh, 50, six, not many, but there's certain cuisines uh, that are absent. German restaurants, uh, uh, you know, there are virtually none in, the, in uh, New York. Scandinavian, you know, there was the Gripsholm, the Stockholm, the Copenhagen, uh, like on 57th Street. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, of course, now there's a new Scandinavian. Right, this, the restaurant Agern, Agern in Grand Central Station is, uh, is Danish and high-end, cutting-edge Danish, but not smorgasbord, obviously. Well, they do have smorgasbord sandwiches in their food hall right next to the restaurant. Ah, right, right. And actually, the food hall, I think, is much better than the no. I'm not supposed to editorialize on that. Is um, uh, liked and accepted, and it's part of this, you know, growth of um, liking of robust flavors and the pecan, and, and um, medicinal elements, and and, and and like turmeric having a quasi medicinal aura at least. In early uh, 20th century social worker notebooks, you get all sorts of stuff about, you know, Italians and their use of garlic and what a bad thing this is. <laughs> that garlic stimulates the desire for alcohol, uh, that uh, these people are irresponsible. They're, they're cooking in olive oil, which is expensive, uh, and real Americans use butter. Uh, they're spending hours cooking food for lunch, whereas real Americans, you know, get out the sliced bread, the cheese, and, and, and that's it. So the, the notion that immigrants spend too much time on food, uh, fuss about food, that the smell of their cooking pervades the apartment building at 10.30 a.m., and that this is somehow, this is not American. Either it interferes with work or leisure, uh, but, but uh, cooking is regarded as uh, you know, it's as if you just vacuumed all the time. <laughs> That's some obsessive compulsive desire to clean your floors. What do you think the food channel and all of this? Here? Well, I'm talking about the early 20th century. This is this is gone, yes. But the food channel and all the TV shows, the rise of the TV cooking shows coincides with a decline in the amount of cooking yeah. being done. So you can make fun of the 1950s and you know all the Jello salads and all the <laughs> mushroom soup stuff, but actually most people took most of their meals at home, uh, and so there's a lot of cooking going on in the 1950s, tons of it, much more than now. It, it might not meet our seal of sophisticated approval. Um, so these restaurants were definitely changing uh, how food was treated in America. Was there um, as much of a change in how beverages were treated um, throughout this period of time? I'm sorry, how? Uh, beverages and uh, drinks throughout this uh, period of time in the restaurants? Yeah, you know, you know, uh, I think the history of beverages is partly the history of the rise, fall, and rise of things like cocktails. Um, the uh, most dramatic thing that's going on now is the decline of uh, carbonated yeah. sugar drinks. Uh, so the rise of substitutes, beginning with things like Snapple 
and then extending to you know 850 power beverages, eight dollars and fifty cent power beverages. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. I, I was criticized by the publication Wine Spectator for not having enough about wines, but you know you you, you can't you can't do everything. So um, I'm I'm giving a, a talk sometime in February, I think, at the 92nd Street. Why with a guy named Robert Simonson who wrote a book about cocktails. So maybe we'll maybe we'll, co we'll cover that uh, cover that then. Well, I think I've gone on probably. Yeah, one more question. I hope this isn't silly, but I've often thought about, um, and I love the movie Babette's Feast. <laughs> Is there anything equivalent to that? Equivalent to that in the sense of wonderful movie about food? <laughs> uh, Big Night, yeah. Yeah. for example. Does anybody serve that kind of a... They did at the time. I think, you know, again, the, the huge tortoise. That's a hard, that's a hard thing um, to duplicate. And of course now Denmark, which in that movie is presented as having a benighted cuisine, is one of the leading culinary destinations of the world. So you can see how much change the, uh, you know, the, the most celebrated restaurant chef of the past 10 years is probably Rene Redzepi in, in Copenhagen. Um, I will tell you a story about that movie though. Uh, there's another movie called Tampopo that came out about the same time about Japan and food in Japan. And I told my wife that I, why don't we go see, oh yeah, we were just walking we were walking around Lincoln Center, and uh, Babette's piece was showing at that that's Lincoln Cinema where you go downstairs. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Why don't we go see Babette's piece?" And Bonnie said, "No, I don't want to. There's a there's a turtle that gets killed in that movie. I don't want to see that." So we went and saw Tampopo, and in Tampopo, at one point. Uh, they, they kill these turtles. <laughs> and I grabbed her arm and I said, no, you got the wrong movie. But in fact, in both movies, <laughs> turtles get killed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. <I'm> <laughs>
prefer that to going and getting a nice, like, big pasta dish, right? Just something that actually fills you and makes you feel satisfied. It was not satisfying, but it was very interesting. And it was more of an intellectual experience than anything else. Yeah, but that's not good. Huh? It should be an intellectual experience and Oh, most of the things tasted very good. Yeah. But there, there's, a, there's a distinction. Thank you. I'm head of the lectures committee oh, here. Oh, oh, thank you so Francesco. much. Yes. Look forward to this so much. And I, you know, I have, there's a, you probably have, I bought my daughter a book on Strauss that came out about 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, when everyone, everybody me. dined at Strauss. Yeah, yeah, and I think the supply of Irish waiters is dried up. That may be an explanation. Exactly. You know, remember the shoes, the little black shoes? Well, you know, there was somebody I met who, who, whose family is from Ireland. She said, oh, my grandmother uh, was a waitress.